Ansel Adams' photography reflects his environment. San Francisco, where he was born. The High Sierra. Yosemite. Most famous for his landscapes full of space and light, Ansel Adams has combined creative and professional photography on the highest level of awareness and craftsmanship. Musician, teacher, writer, and conservationist, Ansel Adams' work has been modulated by what he calls the great earth gesture of the Sierra. Many people using a camera bypass their natural environment. He does not. The roots of his development are basically naturalistic. To photograph truthfully and effectively is to see beneath the surface and record the qualities of nature and humanity which live or are latent in all things. Elemental nature must be approached with a reverential lens. The grand landscapes and the blade of grass appear with equal eloquence. Expression is not enough. Design, style, technique, these too are not enough. Art must reach further than self-expression. Art, said Alfred Stieglitz, is the affirmation of life. And life, or its eternal evidence, is everywhere. I first came to Yosemite Valley with my family in 1916, and I have not missed a single year since then. Every year has been an extraordinary experience, and as time goes on, this experience becomes more penetrating and more related to the world at large. My work has always been associated with Yosemite. It has become the warp and woof of my whole being. But this experience has never meant isolation, on the contrary, the infinitely varied photographic problems of Yosemite have helped to develop my techniques and deepen my perception. The Adams home in Yosemite was built in 1926 by Virginia Adams' father, a painter and music lover. Here the Adams children grew up. Ansel Adams worked on his music and began his photographic career. Here Virginia Adams is a gracious hostess to a never ending stream of friends and a partner in her husband's many ventures. The imprint of her personality is in evidence throughout the house. Some photographers take reality as the sculptor takes wood or stone and upon it impose the dominations of their own thought and spirit. Others come before reality more tenderly. A photograph to them is an instrument of love and revelation. A true photograph need not be explained nor can it be contained in words. The photographic image is visualized at the moment of exposure. It finds expression only in the final print. Since non-photographic processes cannot fully duplicate the range and subtleties of the expressive print, Ansel Adams has from time to time issued limited editions of original photographs in portfolio form. Expressions without doctrine, my photographs are presented as ends in themselves. The grandeurs and intimacies of nature will, I hope, encourage the spectator to seek for himself the inexhaustible sources of beauty in the natural world around him. Fortunate is he, indeed, who can see Mount McKinley against the summer midnight sky. The lush fern forest of Kilauea. the white jubilance of Yosemite's waters,
and the somber Atlantic rock and surf of Arcadia. But perhaps in his own garden, even in a flower pot on a windowsill, a single leaf turned to the sun will hint of the revelation of nature so grandly expressed in the domains of the national park. Perhaps the dominant quality of Yosemite in autumn is the remarkable character of the light. The summer haze seems to have dissipated. The light is soft and yet decisive. The waterfalls are reduced to almost total extinction. The river is low. The autumn foliage in the valley acquires an extraordinary luminosity and there is a certain mood of expectancy in the air, suggesting the imminence of the coming winter storms. I believe that wilderness is largely a state of mind. The material aspects of the world, the rocks, the trees, the air, are but symbols. As Nancy Newhall wrote in This is the American Earth, the wilderness holds for us more answers than we know yet how to ask. We are now sufficiently advanced to consider resources other than materialistic, but they are tenuous, intangible, and vulnerable to misapplication. They are, in fact, symbols of a spiritual life, a vast impersonal pantheism, transcending the confused myths that are presumed to clarify ethical and moral conduct. The clear realities of nature, seen with the inner eye of the spirit, reveal the ultimate echo of God. If the domains of both nature and art have strongly influenced our culture, why can we not bring them into more definite association? In my own experience here in Yosemite, I find that there are many who approach the opportunity of hearing great music with almost religious devotion. For there is always great magic in the mingling of the emotional experience of nature and of the aesthetic experience of art.
Ansel Adams' affinity with nature has never met withdrawal from contemporary life. He is equally at home in Yosemite and in the city of San Francisco, where he was born, studied music, and does much of his work. Even in the city, the objects that surround Ansel Adams reflect his affinity with the natural scene and with the works of artists and craftsmen who are deeply rooted in their native surroundings. The Adams homes have always been a gathering place for artists, conservationists, musicians, and students. My approach to teaching is, I am sure, quite unorthodox. I think of teaching as far more than the mere conveyance of facts and methods. It is a matter of taking the student into one's confidence time and again, and making it possible for him to reciprocate. The student must feel that he, together with you, is making the great exploration into the world of creation. Perhaps Khalil Gibran, in his noble work, The Prophet, has given the most penetrating definition of the ideal teacher. The teacher, if he be indeed wise, does not bid you enter the house of his wisdom, but rather lead you to the threshold of your own mind. Many young photographers have studied with Ansel Adams. Jerry Sharp. Perkle Jones. Philip Green. Don Worth. It is no mere coincidence that Ansel Adams' discussions of photography often revolve around such terms as composition, tonal values, the negative as a score, and the finished print as a performance. An art is definable only in its own terms. It is as difficult to speak about photography as it is about music. Penetrating the smoke screen of equipment and techniques, the art of photography appears as strong and vital as any other creative medium. As Wilensky once put it, all art is the expression of the same thing.
artist need not interfere with professional assignments. Rather, the artist doing professional work can draw on his subconscious for the perception necessary to do an imaginative job without gimmicks. Photography is only as honest or dishonest as the photographer himself. His subconscious is constantly at work. When it comes into phase with the outside world, portrait is more than a mere likeness. Ansel Adams' concept of environmental portraiture creates symbolic values directly related to his appraisal of the subject's character. The approach can be literal, an architect surrounded by his blueprints, or the artist can use more subtle means of characterization. Even those unfamiliar with Clarence Kennedy's photography of Renaissance sculpture cannot fail to sense his style when confronted with this portrait which is so subtly in tune with Kennedy's own work. Adams has always been conscious of his work in relation to other photographers. Throughout the short history of photography, there have been very few really great photographers practicing anywhere. Strand represents work the first great influence of my career. I met Paul Strand first in New Mexico, either in 1929 or 1930. One day in Paul's studio, he showed me quite a few of his four by five negatives, and they were a complete revelation. I had never before seen photographs of this simple direct clarity, and the negatives themselves were so beautiful that it was almost unnecessary to visualize the final print. Paul Strand is, of course, one of the very greatest artists of our time, and without doubt, one of the greatest printers in all the history of photography. This mailbox belonged to a great and unassuming man. I first met Edward Weston in the studio of Albert Mender in San Francisco. I think it was about 1928. This was the beginning of a long friendship which reached into many corridors of experience. There were many visits in our homes, trips to the mountains, Carmel, Yosemite, and San Francisco. Edward Weston's work is one of the unique creative monuments of our time. In some strange way, destiny contrived to bring Edward Weston and his work together in a world greatly in need of clarification and simplicity. I first met Alfred Stieglitz in New York in 1933. The experience was a tremendous one for me. It opened up not only vast perspectives in photography, but concepts and ideas relating to the entire world of art. To Alfred Stieglitz, the only thing that mattered was the sun and the earth and growing things, and what these things were in relation to humanity. The agony of humanity was in direct relation to humanity's separation from the truth and from nature. People were as growing things, just like trees. Historic periods are but the topography of time. He believed that the expressive potential of man is timeless, and that those who self-consciously strive for mere contemporary expression are dated and sterile from the start. He claimed that the tragedy of America lies in her exploitation of nature and of the human potential. His attitude was the obverse of conceit. 
It was an attitude of responsibility and humility in the largest sense. He was a dour prophet to those who believed that something is better than nothing, but was a luminous guiding spirit to those who have faith in the potentials of our land and our people, who work and build from within the limitless resources of the spirit. The artist must contemplate all things and all of nature's changes in order to gain a sense of the permanent and the significant. Ansel Adams' work always leads him back to nature, a fountain of basic inspiration for the artist. The dawn wind of the high sea era is not just a passage of cool air through forest conifers, but within the labyrinth of human consciousness becomes a stirring of some world magic of most delicate persuasion. The grand lift of the Tetons is more than a mechanistic fold and faulting of the Earth's crust. It becomes a primal gesture of the Earth beneath a greater sky. And on the ancient Acadian coast, an even more ancient Atlantic surge disputes the granite headlands with more than the slow crumbling erosion of the sea. Here are forces familiar with the eons of creation. Our time is short, and the future terrifyingly long. Believing as we must that things of the heart and mind are most enduring, this is the opportunity to apply art as a potent instrument of revelation, of touching the conscience and clearing the vision.
This is National Educational Television.